All right, let's open our Bibles this morning, please, to Revelation chapter 3. As we continue our verse-by-verse study here, been loving this uh, study as we continue through the book of Revelation. Uh, the only book in the Bible that promises blessings upon us for uh, reading and hearing uh, and keeping the things that are written here in these books or these letters. So the, just a, a wonderful uh, book. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. And uh, we're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 6 uh, and then we'll pray. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have made, you have a name, that uh, you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few things even in Sard or excuse me, a few names even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, as we come once again uh, to your word, Lord, to feast even here this morning, pray that you'd soften our hearts, Lord, uh, make them ready to receive these things, uh, your word that is living. Uh, may you convict us, may you change us, may you encourage us, Lord, whatever you want to do, uh, we sit at your feet to listen. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this morning we're really going to be focusing in on uh, verse 1, and it says, And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So as we come here to this fifth letter uh, to the church of Sardis, Jesus is dictating uh, letters to the apostle John, uh, to seven churches uh, that are there in Asia. And if you remember, some of the commentators uh, called the first letter, the letter to Ephesus, uh, the letter to the loveless church. Uh, and some commentators called the letter to Smyrna, uh, the letter to the persecuted church. Uh, Pergamus, the letter to the compromising church. Thyatira, the letter to the corrupt church. And then here, we come to Sardis, uh, and they say it's the letter to the dead church. And so notice it says, to the angel of the church in Sardis. Again, this isn't some secret, like, wacky code. Uh, the angel there, we're told in chapter 1, is simply the pastor, the leader who is over uh, the church there in Sardis. And uh, so it goes on to say uh, to the church in Sardis. Now, Sardis, uh, in these days, uh, it was a commercial city uh, located roughly 30 miles uh, south and east of Thyatira, the last uh, letter we studied. Now, it's interesting to notice that it was on a trade route from the east to the west, uh, and it was also the kingdom, or excuse me, the, the capital of the kingdom of Lydia, which was part of the Roman Empire. Uh, it was also known as a wealthy city because of that trade route. Uh, they were known to sell jewelry, making textiles and uh, dye and other such things. But it's also interesting to note that it was also uh, the, basically the center of pagan worship uh, there in the area. Uh, specifically, uh, they had the, the Grand Temple of Artemis, or two Artemis there. Uh, the ruins you can still go and visit today. Uh, and today, uh, if you go to that once great city, it's gone. There's a little village there called Sart uh, that you can go visit, visit. Now, it's interesting, too, to note is that the archaeologists, uh, they found next to the Temple of Artemis, uh, they found the remains of a Christian church there. Uh, and so we don't know exactly when that church was there, but it's kind of interesting to note uh, that it was built literally right next to the temple of Artemis. Now, 
Notice it says these things, verse 1 continues, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God, <clears throat> excuse me, and the seven stars. Uh, now, if you remember uh, back in chapter 1, uh, this book is called the book of Revelation. And basically what it means is, is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And all you have to do is literally read chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, some of your Bibles will even say the revelation of John or John the Apostle or the Apostle John or the revelation of the apocalypse. But it's actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the beautiful thing there in chapter 1 is that the Lord describes himself in new ways, revealing ways, re revealing who he is, revelation. And so as we see here in each one of the seven letters, Jesus takes a portion of that description and he sends it to each of these churches. Now here he's using where he says, um, the seven spirits of God. He who has the seven spirits of God. Now we talked about this again back in chapter one. We'll just kind of briefly highlight it again. Uh, the seven spirits of God uh, here is basically referencing a description of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, God's Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of Jesus. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, you'll see it behind me. Um, it says this, uh, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now again, this isn't seven differing spirits or seven different spirits. This is a description of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, what's interesting to note, too, is that why did Jesus refer to this here to the letter in Sardis? Well, remember, the, this is the dead church. And so he's kind of reminding them, look, the Spirit of the Lord, the seven spirits, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, of understanding, counsel, and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Evidently. They had forgotten about these things. They had set them aside. And so again, it says here that the things of this, uh, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go buy a book to figure out what the seven stars are. One of those Bible code books, uh, if you've seen them, the, the Bible code of Revelation. I'm just kidding. Uh, we're told back in chapter 1, at the end of, verse, of chapter 1, uh, what the seven stars represent. And basically, they represent the seven pastors of the seven churches that Jesus is writing to. It's very straightforward. The book of Revelation, I'm not saying there aren't some things in here that are going to be kind of hard to, to grasp. There will be some, but for the most part, it's very put forward, uh, straightforward. So again, he's the one that, you know, the seven spirits of God. He also, you know, has the seven stars. He, he, they're in his hand, those pastors. And one continues, he says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you are dead. I know your works. You know, for some people, we've talked about this before. He said this in each of the other letters. I, I know your works. And to the Christian, that should bring a deep sense of peace. Uh, the Lord knows our works. He sees them. But at times, even as a Christian, uh, prayerfully it will bring a little bit of fear, a godly fear, into our hearts if we're not walking. Our works aren't after the Lord. We're not doing the things that he tells us to do, or we're even doing some things he tells us not to. The Lord knows your works. But for the Christian, I just love, uh, you know, thinking about the love of the Lord for us. I love singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. You know, and because God loves us so much, and especially those who are in Christ Jesus, his son. Years ago, um, you, you know, when our girls were little, we have three girls, and every once in a while, probably once a week or once every couple of weeks, uh, they, all of a sudden I'd be up in my office doing my, you know, work, and, and I'd get a knock on the door, and one of the girls would come in with a little folded piece of paper, sometimes an envelope, and it was an invitation to a show, and I'd open up, we're doing a, a dance show downstairs in the front room at, you know, four o'clock, be there, be square kind of thing, and so we knew, Talia and I knew we had to be there, so Talia and I would show up at 4 p.m., and, and the girls would come, and they'd have this little tray of snacks. Would you like a snack, you know, for the show? And, oh, sure, thank you, dear. Would you like something to drink? And so they'd give us something to drink. 
And then they'd put the show on and they'd turn this music on and they'd be doing dances and, you know, doing all these different things. And I have to say, it was horrible. <laughs> horrible. But it was the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen in my life. I still remember every time they did it here. So beautiful to me. Beloved in Christ, you might be thinking, man, Lord, I, 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 I'm doing terrible as a Christian. Lord, I, you know, I, I'm trying to do all these things for you, Lord, but I just keep failing. But you know what? Here's the beauty. God knows your works. He looks at you with that same Father's heart. Oh, look, there's my, my kid. They're, they're trying. I, that's it. And it, with him, this is one of my beautiful things. I see them trying. God loves you. If you're in Christ, God loves you with a special love. He looks at you through Jesus Christ. He sees his son in and through you. And he is well pleased, by the way. And, and so what does that do for me? It encourages me to get back up if I fall. I don't stay there in the mud. I get back up. And I, oh, oh, Lord. And he doesn't spake me. Maybe sometimes he will. The Lord chastises us, but he, he, whom he loves. But he gets us back up. And he goes, okay, let's keep going, keep moving. Let's, you know, I'm right here with you. I'm your dad. I'm your, I'm your Abba. I'm your father. And so when, when God says, I know your works, prayerfully, most of the times that's going to bring a joy. Now, sometimes it should bring a holy fear, a good holy fear that turns us away from those bad works. And sadly, look, that's what's going on here. He goes, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Now, it's interesting, in the ESV, it says you have the reputation, you have the reputation of being alive, not just the name. And again, it's interesting, is he knows the works, he knows that they have this reputation. They have this name amongst the people of being alive. The Greek word reputation is onoma. And it literally means a reputation or a name. You know, you know, I have a really good name in this community. I'm well known. And that's the thought behind it. You see, they had a good name within the church. The church in general, oh, the church in Sardis, man, they're alive. Notice, you have the reputation of being alive. Alive here in the Greek is uh, zeas, and it literally means alive, living, active, to live, not lifeless. They were known all around, maybe even within Sardis, of being this church, this reputation of being alive, not lifeless, but being alive. Yet Jesus, the one who said earlier that he knows their works, notice what he says. Hey, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Now, here's an interesting point, just a quick side note. You know, today... It's so easy to listen to all the voices that are out there. It's so easy to get caught up in the things of the world, even some of the voices within the church, and instead of hearing the voice of God. You see, sometimes when we're going off into sin, the, the world definitely cheers us on. Hey, that's okay. Yes, you can still be a Christian and do all the sin. The world totally says, that's actually a real Christian. That's what the world tells us, and even some within the church. But what does God say? Oh, no, no, that's sin. Oh, no, no, if you do, you, you might think you're alive, but you're dead. May we be those who listen to God through his word first and put his word priority above everyone else and what they say, even ourselves. See, here they had this great reputation for being alive. Everyone thought they were alive, but Jesus says, look, you are dead. So who do they believe? The reputation that they have? A lot of us like to believe our reputation. You ever met anybody like that who maybe is a little bit famous or maybe they're very famous and they love being famous. You ever met anybody like that? I've met many people like that in my life. They love to be famous, love to be, even within the church, by the way, certain pastors, it's like, oh, yeah, you're a pastor too. That's good for you, little fella. Probably a little church, huh? You know, it's like... Okay, God bless you too, brother. I'm serious. I've met worship leaders. I, it's crazy. But you see, I don't look to them for my commendation. I shouldn't at least. I'm not saying I haven't fallen into sin sometimes and like, oh. But, but we need to look at what Jesus has to say. Not what everybody else. Again, they had the reputation of being alive. But they were dead. Dead here in the Greek is nekros. It literally means dead. Literally or figuratively. Deceased. Departed. Destitute of life. Zodiades, the Greek scholar, said it this way. I love this. A dead person or body that has not yet been buried. 
So this is a church, it's dead, but it hasn't been buried yet. They think they're alive. You know, I've heard many times at, at different things when people go to view a body, a lot of, um, you know, churches will have what's called a viewing. And so you go and you view it. Oh, you know, I've heard people say over and over, they just look like they're sleeping. They don't look dead. They just look like they're sleeping. Well, this church didn't even look like it was sleeping. It looked alive. It looked healthy. It looked fine. It sounded alive, full of life. They have this reputation of it, again, presumptuously, against the, presumptuously amongst the church uh, and even the community there, the church there. So this means it must have been a vibrant church. It had to have a lot of people going to it. Uh, you know, maybe they were singing songs a lot and they were doing church things. They looked to everyone around as if they were alive, thriving, and active. You know, perhaps they were very active in their community. Uh, the people in Sardis, maybe they, they loved them. Maybe they were feeding the homeless. Maybe they were walking in marches with Antifa and Black Lives Matter. Uh, maybe they were, you know, loving those that were living in sin in the city and, you know, inviting them into the church saying, you don't have to repent, that Jesus accepts you as you are. You don't have to change. They could have had fun nights with the youth and the teens, and instead of studying the Word of God, they were playing games. But they were alive after all, at least. That's what everyone told them. That's what their reputation said. But again, what does Jesus say here? That they were dead. They're like a dead person or a body that has not yet been buried. Now, when the church lets the things of the world into the church, it then by default allows sin itself to come into the church. And we are told clearly throughout the scriptures that sin always brings death. It brings physical death. It brings spiritual death. So I believe this is why the church at Sardis was dead. Because while it seemed alive on the outside, it was nothing but a whitewashed sepulcher with dead man's bones on the inside. Nice and lively looking on the outside, but dead and corroded on the inside. Again, it's a sin that brings death to people and also to the church. And I believe this is what happened to the church there in Sardis. How many today, how many churches today believe that they're alive simply because they go and have fun together? Oh, man, our church is great. We just go there and we have a great time. And it's just, oh, the pastor, oh, he's so funny. He makes me laugh every time. Just great stuff. Maybe, uh, you know, even today, some believe their church is alive and doing great because they have community in the church. That's where I go to have community with other people there. I don't care about what's being taught. I don't care about Jesus. I just, I have good friends. I've had people at Simple Faith over the years come up to me. Yeah, the only reason we're actually coming here is because I have a group of friends here. I don't really care about the church. I've literally had people say that to me. You know, maybe others believe their church is alive and doing great because their pastor looks and sounds cool. You know what I'm talking about. They kind of dress up like Justin Bieber, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of the pastors today putting on the skinny jeans. I tried that for years. It still hasn't made me skinny. I'm waiting and, and I'm praying. I remember talking to a fellow a few years ago. You know, hey, how's your church? How, you know, how is it there? He goes, oh, dude, man, we have the coolest. And he literally said this. And this was a guy like in his late 40s, early 50s. He's all, we have the coolest pastor around, man. He has dreadlocks. And I'm like, all right, that's cool. But how's the church? How's the teaching? You know, and it's like, oh, dude, but he's just so cool. And, and, you know, again, we think that if our pastors look cool, if they, you know, look young, or if they're this or that, then, you know, then it's alive. That church is alive. Others think that because their church has thousands of people and get the big names within Christianity, the big, huge Christian worship groups or teachers are speaking, that that means that they're alive. Oh, dude, our church, you know who we're having this weekend, man? We're having this Christian, you know, artist. Oh, we're having this person. Oh, we're just so thriving, dude. This church is so great. Other churches think they're alive because they do have the, the lights and the fog and the, you know, the you know, stuff falling down, the angel feathers from the ceiling. Yet the Holy Spirit of God has departed from them, and they are actually dead in the Lord. They haven't noticed. A.W. Tozer said this, If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 
95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Can I ask guests here this morning or, you know, as we're coming into the afternoon, if the Holy Spirit suddenly left your life, would you keep going on just as you are? Or are you so dependent on the Holy Spirit of God that you would just <laughs> sit there in shock like, where are you, Lord? What's going on? I can't do anything without you. But, but how many of us are like that? How many of us are dependent upon the Spirit of God? Levin Ravenhill said this. He said, I'd rather have 10 people that want God and His Holy Spirit at work in and through them than 10,000 people that, who want to play church. And I say, Amen. I'll be honest with you guys and gals. If we lost 50% in Calvary Chapel, Simple Faith, if we lost 60 or 70 or 80 or 90%, because let's just say there's that many people who aren't being filled with the Holy Spirit of God, walking in the power of the Spirit of God, and we just left this with 10%, I'd be a happy camper. I really would. I, I, I'm just like that. I, I want ten, I'd rather have 10 people who want God who want the spirit of the power of God in their lives and not just the name of a Christian. They're lifeless. They, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple of Christ. But there's no power in their lives. There's no Holy Spirit of power. Can I ask you here this morning? When's the last time you took a step of faith in anything? Well, Pastor, I took a step of faith by getting out of bed this morning. Man, it was pretty hard today, you know? That doesn't take faith. You know, even opening up our Bibles doesn't take that much faith. What have you done that takes faith? What have you done that takes the Spirit of God? What has it done that you couldn't do without the Spirit of God? And if the answer is nothing, I've done nothing lately, then be awakened this morning. Yeah, feel a little bit of the conviction of the Spirit. Don't feel any condemnation. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are Christians. But feel the holy conviction of God. And start to take ventures of faith. Sometimes the venture of faith is going on. It's like, hey, can I give you this track? You know, Jesus loves you. This will tell you the gospel. That that's, can be a venture of faith. Stepping out and telling people about Jesus. Letting people know you're actually a Christian. You know, so many today, so many churches. But also remember, the church is made up of Christians. We are the church. We come here to this church to fellowship one with another, to stir each other up, to love and to good works, to be equipped for the work of the ministry and to go out and do the work of the ministry. So if the church was dead, what does that mean there in Sardis? That means the people were dead, but they didn't even know it. How many are here this morning? How many are watching or listening and you're dead spiritually? You think you're alive in Christianity, but you're not. You're dead. You know, the book of Judges, we see a very good and tragic example of this very thing. In chapter 13 and on, we read about one of the judges of Israel. Very familiar to, I think, probably everyone here. Uh, we've all probably heard of Samson. Everybody here heard of Samson? Samson and Delilah? Well, he was born to godly parents. Uh, he, they had an angel appear to them. Uh, basically, he was consecrated by his mom and dad, a Nazarite to God from the womb, uh, until basically supposed to be till the day of his death. One of the outward signs of his vow was to be that he would never cut his hair. He would never see a blade. Um, he also, as a Nazarite, wasn't to drink strong drink all the days of his life, nor was he to eat anything unclean. And this was all to bring honor to the Lord. They were outward signs of an inward commitment that he had made to the Lord. Uh, and he did apparently, you know, ratify this as he grew up. You know, his mom and dad, you know, made that commitment from the womb. Uh, and in Judges 14, 6, we read that the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And this happened time and time again. The Lord would come mightily upon him and he would do these superhuman strength things. Now, you ever see a movie, even some cartoons, they'll show you Samson, and there's this big, huge Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, kind of guy. I'll bet you 20 bucks, and no, I don't really bet, but I would say that he's probably five foot two, soppy wet, he was 85 pounds, and that he had nothing, he's going to look nothing like we think. You know why? Because it wasn't about bringing glory to Samson and his strength. It was all about the glory of the Lord and his strength. 
And so he did mighty things in the name of the Lord, superhuman things. With the Philistines, God used him time and time again to defeat the Philistines. And even yet, the Philistine leaders, they sent a woman into Samson's life, one he fell into sin with, and one who continually sought to find out the source of his strength. You know, I, I, one of these days I want to go up to Samson, you know, and where it happened and just bob him upside the head and say, bro, you didn't know what she was trying to do? Come on, buddy. And he's going to smack me upside the head and say, oh, bro, what about this in your life and that in your life? Oh, that's true. But so she continued, and he continued to give her wrong answers, yet she was ever persistent. And in Judges 16, 15, we read this. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And look at verse 16. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily, and her words pressed him, so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart. And he said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And we all know what happened, right? He went to take another nap again, and <clears throat> as he was sleeping, uh, he got tied up, and, and they cut, she cut his hair. And then in verse 20, it says, And then she said, Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke up from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. And now here comes one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. The Lord has departed from so many churches today. And I believe that we're in the midst of the great falling away. I, I, I really think that that's part of what's happened because so many people, they don't care about being filled with the Spirit anymore. They don't care about walking in the Spirit anymore. It's more about just being religious. And the Lord has departed. If he was ever there to begin with, he's departed from so many individual Christians today. If he was ever there to begin with. You know, again, even within our church, even here today, uh, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves. You know, there are those who think that they're doing things for Jesus. You know, I'm going to church for Jesus. I'm doing this for Jesus. And, and yet here's the thing. They're doing these things. Lord, Lord, didn't I cast out demons in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't I do this in your name? Yet they never knew Jesus. They never knew him. His spirit has departed from them and they haven't even realized it. Oh, they still meet every Sunday, these churches, just like Sardis. They were meeting every Sunday, probably had a big building and signage, yet they are dead. How? Because they could just keep on being religious. How do they keep going on? How do they keep thriving? Thriving because they're just being religious. They just come and they be religious, acting as if they're alive, and yet they're dead spiritually. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Hey, let's just be real, and I'll put my hand up first. It is so easy to be religious. Anybody else? It's easy to come to church here. You know, it's easy to come to church. Here I am at church. How are you doing, brother? Good to see you, sister. Yes, yes. I, oh, I have my Bible here, too. Oh, no, I use my Bible on my phone now, you know, so still spiritual. And we know all this, the Christian lingo. Praise God, hallelujah, bring, you know, how you doing? Oh, you know, praise Jesus. And then we go get in the car. And all of a sudden, our kids are looking at us as we, you know, snap at our wives or get mad at our kids or snap at our husbands. And the, and, and the kids are going, hey, mom and dad, what happened to Jesus? Did you leave him back in the sanctuary? You go to the homes and there's no power of the Spirit of God in the homes of Christians, in the marriages, with our children. We, we go home and we forget all about Jesus. We, we don't care. We care more about work. We care more about entertainment. We care more about retirement. We care more about politics than we do about Jesus. We can do all those things, by the way. We should do. We should do responsibilities. But they're always under Jesus. They should be. We should just be obsessed with Jesus, filled with Jesus, filled with his power, walking in his, in his spirit continually, being filled with his spirit continually. You see, so many today within Christianity have a form of godliness. 
Maybe a lot of us were raised in Christian homes and we, we learned the form of godliness, the things what to say and not to say, what to do and not to do, and we're still just being religious now. We've never repented of our sins. Seeing the wickedness and grotesqueness of our own sins before a God who is holy and pure and just, and we've not repented of our sins. We've not wept over them and come to the Lord saying, Lord, I repent. I turn away. Will you please forgive me? I believe in you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And so we're just religious. And we don't care. And it's, there's a deadness in our lives. You know, so many who profess Christ. I've seen so many who profess Christ. Even I hear about them today on TikTok or on Instagram. Or, and it's just like they're so depressed. They say they know Jesus, but they're depressed. They say they know Jesus, but there's no filling of the Spirit of God in their life. There's no life in them. There's no joy. Well, what's there to be joyful about, Pastor? Have you looked around lately? I'll tell you what's there to be joyful about. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Can you beat that? Well, I did. I got a raise at work last week. I just got a $10,000 a week raise. There you go. I beat it. No, you didn't. You didn't even come close. Well, well, I just got a brand new television show. I'm going to be famous. I'm TikTok. I got a million views. Doesn't even come close to the love of Jesus. Nothing that the world has to offer even comes close. Yet we all can chase after him so much more and never find the fulfillment, never find the peace. Who cares about all the stuff of the world? And I'm telling you, if you really do care about all the stuff in the world, I think you're, if God do, doesn't rapture us, we're all in for a big shaking, especially us as Americans. I'm serious. And a lot of us will be shaking in our faith if we're not putting Jesus first. For me, we look at our house, I'm not saying we wouldn't be sad. It's all junk. It's all stuff. It's all the Lord's. I ain't taking none of it with me. You know why? Because there's all better stuff in heaven. There's a better person. His name is Jesus. That's where we find life, isn't it? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we need to understand this, guys and gals, that, that if we want more of life in our lives, we need more of Jesus in our lives. Less of us. More of him. We must decrease. He must increase. And we need to be those who, who look around us and say, Lord, where am I at? Do I have dead spots in my life? You know, a lot of people, when they're, that we get older in the Lord for some reason, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk to them and say, like, oh, dude, you know, and they'll talk, oh, I was there for the tent days at Calvary Chapel. Oh, I went to see that movie, you know, the Jesus Revolution. Oh, I remember those days. Woo! That was so on fire, bro. Do you remember that? God was doing all these radical things. So awesome. And it's like, oh, God's not doing that in your life anymore? It's like, no. And I go, why not? Still doing it in our lives and some of the other people here I know lives. Why isn't he? Because we're not people of faith. We're not people walking in accordance to the word of God, being filled with the spirit of God. God wants to do, he didn't just stop. Oh, we're done. That's all done back there. It's all done. We're still here, aren't we? The Lord is here. And he wants to use you for his glory. And guys and gals, if ever he needed us to be men and women totally sold out for Jesus Christ, it is now. There is a world out there that needs the gospel, that needs the true light of Jesus Christ. Sadly, there's plenty of people walking around with the name of Christian that are dead. Is that you here today? Come alive in Jesus Christ. Maybe I'm not saying you're not a Christian. Maybe you've just fallen asleep. Maybe you've become a carnal Christian. Maybe you're, you've been a baby Christian for 40 years. Wake up today. Maybe you've been religious all your life. Wake up and come to true and saving faith in Jesus Christ and be born again of his spirit today. Because where Jesus is, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is life. There is power. And it's a power that God wants to use in you and me, not to make us famous, not to make us rich, but to use us for his glory here upon the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word once again. And thank you for just that you're right out there with the church there in Sardis. And I pray for each one of us here, those watching or listening, 
Lord, that if there's dead areas in our lives, Lord, if there's a deadness, Lord, a, a callousness, Lord, that you would just come in and, and, and we would repent of those and you'd come in and refresh us, Lord. I pray for those who haven't to come to true and saving faith. Lord, they don't even, this is all foreign to them. Oh, that they would just come to true and saving faith in you, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would bless and strengthen and deepen and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.